Hello everyone and welcome to the GPE webinar series. Uh, today's webinar, which we're very, very excited about, is Gender Responsive Pedagogy in Early Childhood Education. My name is Krista McConnell and I am an Education Specialist uh, and the Thematic Lead for Early Childhood Care and Education here at GPE. Um, and today in Washington, I'm joined by my colleagues from the webinar team. Um, and we came together to bring you this webinar today. I'm also very excited for um, our esteemed panelists um, who are going to provide us some really exciting information um, on their toolkit and their work. Um, so the webinar series uh, that, we ha that this one is a part of um, is GP's response to our um, partner countries' request for more information, for knowledge sharing, um, and how we can kind of provide um, more in-depth practical knowledge uh, to help steer education policies and practices in our countries. Um, before we begin, uh, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today. Um, the first I need to remind myself is that the uh, webinar is being um, live streamed in both French and English. Uh, so a reminder <laughs> to everyone that when we're speaking to speak a little slower so that um, our translators can, can pick it up. Um, also, I know many of you are joining and I hope you um, have questions and comments based on maybe your own country experiences that you want to share as part of a Q&A session. Uh, so we're going to um, have a few panelists and presentations and then, um, you know, really we want to this to be an interactive session. So we will have a Q&A session that will follow. Um, so as the presentation is ongoing, if you have questions or comments, um, you have two ways to to direct them to our team. Uh, the first is to use the live chat feature um, in the YouTube channel. And then the second is, uh, if you prefer, you can also send an email to webinars at globalpartnership.org. Uh, so either the live stream chat function or webinars at globalpartnership.org. Um, and we'll be able to kind of cue your questions um, and be able to answer them at the end. Um, when you do ask a question, please state your name, your organization, uh, obviously your question, and then uh, who your question, which one of your panelists, or maybe all of your panelists, your question is directed to. Um, one last housekeeping item, I'll just mention that um, today's session is being recorded. Um, so if you have registered for this webinar, we'll, in a few days' time, I assume, we'll send you uh, the link to the live recording that you can uh, further share with uh, your colleagues and your networks. Um, so I'll, without further ado, uh, let's get started uh, with this exciting webinar. I would like to introduce you to our three uh, panelists that are joining us. So we have Martha Muezi, who's the Executive Director for Fawai Africa, um, and she's joining us today from Nairobi. We have Anna Muru, who's the Global Partnership Manager for VBOB, and Dr. Hetembo Moya, who's a lecturer from the University of Zambia, and both of them are joining us from Lusaka. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Martha uh, to begin our session today. Thank you. Having technical difficulties. Martha, are you there? Can you unmute your mic? Martha? Sorry, we, we had seen her in our connection previously. All right, so in the, in the interest of time due to our technical difficulties, uh, we're going to try to reconnect uh, to Martha 
in Nairobi. But in the meantime, um, Anna and Dr. Hatembo, do you mind if we turn it over to you? Uh, no problem. We can start with the uh, slide. Uh, let me just go back. Sorry, apologies for this. Uh, we will go to slide. Which number is it? I believe it's slide eight. Slide eight, please. You can go backwards. I mean, forward. The next slide. The next slide, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, okay, we will hear about more about gender responsive pedagogy from Martha as she joins us, but uh, we will try to zero in on uh, what is gender responsive pedagogy uh, um, at early childhood education. So uh, until recently, gender responsive pedagogy was limited to primary and secondary targeting environments for adolescent children. And uh, gender responsive pedagogy is all about creating an environment where all children can thrive and where all children are given the opportunity to basically uh, reach their full potential. And it was targeted at adolescent girls because of the need to actually um, eliminate the differences between uh, boys and girls in the education field. So, um, while until recently this has been limited to uh, primary and secondary, um, the case to intervene earlier has been uh, backed by research and has been compelling because we now know and we have a lot of research that uh, points to the fact that children form a concept of self and their gender roles between the ages of three and seven. Uh, by this age, children already have a good idea of what uh, society expects from them, how they fit in the household, what their role should be in the home, and they, for example, mirror what they see in their household. So they see at home that their mother is doing their housework and that their father is always out and working in challenging jobs. Women are also always expected to be pretty and men are expected to be strong. So these things they carry with them. Teachers also carry their own stereotypes, and that's why we need to intervene early. Stereotypes formed in early years influence children's views of themselves and others and have an impact on their educational progression and future there socialization. Is, I'm, I'm sorry, the interpreter is sorry, but there is an additional mic that is interfering and is open. Could I ask all the participants to turn off their mics so that the presenter can do their presentation? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you, great. Okay, so how does this happen oh, concretely? How does this happen in practice? Anna, sorry? sorry. Just to interrupt, it looks like we do have Martha is now connected. Um, All right, great. <laughs> so I we'll apologize. mute our mic and we'll wait our turn. Okay, thank you. I apologize that we're going back and forth. Uh, so, Mark, Martha, welcome back. Um, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties for everyone. Um, but maybe we can bring it back to, to Martha's presentation and we'll return um, to Anna and Lusaka. Yeah, thank you, Christine. I, I got cut off, but I'm now back. And uh, I was just starting, sorry everybody for the technological issue, but I was just giving a very brief background about FAWE. And I was saying FAW is a Pan-African organization, and it was founded in, in 1992 by five visionary ministers of education then, who felt if we were talking about education for all, it called for deliberate effort to put in place mechanisms that ensure that girls are part and parcel of the education process. And we are, as FAW, we are a Pan-African organization, and we are present in 33 countries on the continent, and the founding of FAWE was uh, premised on the fact that if women are supported, they get into school, they, con they complete the education cycle, and they, they don't drop out of school. They contribute to the bigger force and in, parts of, in terms of decision making that contributes to uh, policies and all that is required for uh, education that would benefit 
all. Uh, the region office is based in Nairobi in Kenya. And when we talk about uh, Wi-Fi was founded, it was also uh, based on the fact that, that uh, when women are part of the education system, they also significantly contribute because they do understand the challenges and they are able to make constructive contribution in terms of what needs to be done if all are supposed to be benefit from education. And generally talking about uh, FAWE as an institution, we work, uh, we work with different partners in education and with a vision of ensuring that girls access education, keep in school, complete the education cycle, and also perform well. Perform well. And we also look at the, our vision, I'm sorry, our, our mission in terms of ensuring that there is gender equity and equality in education. What we do and how we contribute to education in Africa, it's through policy influence, we work very closely with um, We work very closely with the minister, ministers of education in terms of policy related to education to ensure that all policies are gender responsive. We also demonstrate what we, we have implemented and what we feel uh, needs to be replicated by ministries of education if all girls are supposed to benefit from education. And that's what we call the gender responsive models. We, our work is also supported by research. We do a lot of research and that's what informs what we do. And like I mentioned, we work very closely with the ministries of education in all countries where we have presence. And also we work through our chapters and we reach out to the community. Can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, when we talk about uh, gender responsive pedagogy, we are looking at the gender discrimination that does exist in sub-Saharan Africa. And when we talk about gender discrimination, it manifests through varied means and varied aspects. And some of the few that I highlight with you today is the bias teaching and learning materials that are into books, that are into all different types of instructional materials that create, the, that portray uh, a negative picture about women and education. We also look at the insensitive language use. What language the teachers use in the classroom? Is it a language that motivates the learners or is it a language that would demotivate the, the learners? We also focus on the teaching methodologies. What methodologies are, we, are the teachers applying as they pass on the instruction, the education instruction to the learners? And we also focus on the method or the framework that would ensure that there are more girls just as good as the boys in the school, but also looking at the subjects that are being done in school. Is there opportunity that is being given to all through the teaching and learning methodologies? For instance, when you look at STEAM for girls, are the teaching methodologies motivating or encouraging to the girls so that they're also part and of the uh, the learning process and are they able to participate in STEM or is the language that is used is that language that would denote that science is for the boys and not meant for the girls. We also look at uh, some of the biases or role models that are portrayed in some of the teaching materials that would undermine, uh, that would make the girls feel what is what is available is only for the boys and it's not meant for them. And of course it also goes to infrastructure within the school, what kind of infrastructure, I mean infrastructure is in the school, looking at the sanitary facilities, for instance, do they uh, enable the girls to keep in school for all the year round or are they uh, put off because of lack of certain facilities? And uh, looking at this, we also realize that when we are talking about And when we are talking about uh, the, the, the discrimination, we are saying it, is, it manifests in different ways. And one of the biggest, or one of the glaring is the GBV, that is the gender-based violence, and particularly looking at school-related gender-based violence. It's very, it's very rampant in, rampant in sub-Saharan Africa. And just pointing out a few of them, for instance, bullying, Bullying is one of the ways of the 
uh, school-related gender-based violence. And it, uh, research has brought out certain factors, I mean, certain data that does, uh, that, uh, I mean, that, uh, that it has data that actually shows that bullying affects the, the learners and it can cause to dropping out. And then also there, there's ramp rampart, there's a, uh, corporal punishment in many of the schools and the, a number of students have also been forced to drop out of school because of corporal punishment that is also has been researched and there's evidence to that. And then also the fact that there's no legal protection against uh, corporal punishment. This in, continues to contribute to the number of uh, girls that drop out of school. And in addition to that, there is also sexual violence and the sexual violence in school is student to student and also teachers and the students. The next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, continue with the gender-based violence in sub-Saharan Africa. They are, we've highlighted just a number of uh, countries which have uh, where research has been conducted and looking at Malawi, for instance, 61% of gender-based violence has affected girls and the number of girls have dropped out. Also, looking at Cameroon, there is 30% of sexual violence on school girls and this is mainly committed by the male students. And then also 40% of the school heads have been reported the pupil sexual harassment, which is sometimes or often. And then also looking at the pupil harassment, which has also been uh, reported. That has also proved to be very, very uh, rampant in, uh, in, uh, in schools. And when you look, we are looking at that, all that contributes to the girls dropping out of school. And uh, can we move to the next slide, please? And now looking at the background information that I've just provided in terms of the gender discrimination, in terms of the gender-based violence that has led, that leads to the number of girls not benefiting from the education cycle and not completing the education cycle, it was found very, very inevitable by FAWE to introduce uh, models that do support girls, models that uh, enable girls to get into school, keep into school, and uh, complete the education cycle. And one of these models is what we are focusing on today, and that's the gender responsive pedagogy. In the past, we have had a gender responsive pedagogy which has been targeting teachers at secondary and primary levels. But in the recent past, we realized that it's very good if we come up also with a manual similar to that of secondary, but which addresses the teachers at an early stage to equip the teachers with the, the skills that can contribute to the changing the norm, the skills that will enable teachers teach from a gender responsive uh, angle to ensure that the biases that do exist from society are all eliminated. And that's how we came up now with the gender responsive pedagogy for early childhood education. And in this pedagogy, I know Anna will give more, uh, more information on that. But just briefly, we are looking at a suitable curriculum materials. What materials do teachers need to use when they are dealing with the young, the, the small children that are just getting into school? We are also looking at the appropriate teaching methodologies and approaches. The way the teacher teaches, the way the teacher designs the, the lesson determines the perspective that the young people get about others and about themselves. So the money also points to uh, the appropriate teaching approaches and methodologies. And then the language used in the classroom, the, the manual, the toolkit tries to promote that language that the teachers would use and that would be uh, of encouragement to the young ones and also making them appreciate themselves, particularly the girls, to appreciate themselves and look at the boys as their peers and counterparts, but not looking at them as those that are superior. And then there's the gender sensitive physical environment. It, it is the, the physical environment determines whether the children will enjoy school and continue with their studies or they will get discouraged or they may not be uh, motivated to like school. And then the money also looks at the equal and active participation of learners, boys. That's the inter interaction. How, do, how should the teacher uh, use, 
learner centered approach how does how what would the teacher employ to ensure that both the boys and girls are, are active but not only going with those that are very active and leaving the, the others behind and then we also the realization of the full potential of the learners regardless of the gender the 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 the, the model the toolkit also brings out that and it it is it is aimed at helping the teacher to teach or to support the learners with, from a background that uh, uh, clearly shows that both the girl and the boys, when they are given equal opportunity, they can learn very, very well and they can perform very well in education. In other words, the manual tries to break the vicious cycle of the low expectation, especially from girls and young women, particularly by the teachers. So the gender responsive pedagogy for early childhood uh, development in summary is intended to support right from a tender age for the children to avoid the discrimination, for the girls and boys to grow up as peers, to understand and appreciate each other and be able to support each other in education rather than promoting one gender and uh, creating a, a scenario that shows like they are more superior than the others. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then we are just saying GRP trains a teacher. It inspires hope. The way the teacher teaches inspires hope in the learners. It ignites the imagination. And it also instills a love of learning in both female and male learners. As was stated by Brad Henry, this is the foundation of the GRP for the teachers to inspire hope, to ignite the imagination, to make the children think beyond what they see, and also make learning more interesting and more, uh, uh, I mean, liked by the, both the females and the male learners. Thank you. The next slide, I think uh, Anna will take us from the next slide. Yeah, I, as I just conclude, before that, just the previous one, Christine, before we move to that, yeah, that just demonstrates the six pillars of the GRP. When we are talking about the six pillars, we are talking about the language used in the classroom, we are talking about the teaching and learning materials, we are talking about the instruction methodology, we are focusing on the, the, the school management, how supportive is the school management, what about the infrastructure that is in place. So looking at all those pillars, it creates a, a, a very harmonized kind of uh, teaching methodology from a gender responsive approach that can uh, support the teachers to be able to teach the learners from a gender responsive uh, pedagogy. Thank you so much. And now Hannah can take, it, take us from the next slide. Great, thank you again. Um, so yes, we have seen that indeed the case to intervene early is supported by science. Research has shown that children by the age of seven have already seen how they fit in society, what they is expected of them, mm. and what role they have uh, as they become, uh, you know, uh, young adults. So uh, it is really important to intervene before these stereotypes become set. And unfortunately, teachers are um, carry their own stereotypes into the classroom and also have an influence on how children will view themselves how they will progress in education and also their future socialization. So challenging stereotypes before they become set is very important. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Martha, Great. Could, Martha could you end up muting your microphone in Nairobi? Thank you. Uh, Great. So, um, Okay, so as uh, Martha had alluded to, with this in mind, uh, we came up with a project, um, basically, to try to address this issue already at an earlier age, rather than focusing on adolescent children only. Um, so we came up with the idea together to um, promote positive, respectful, and gender equal relations between boys and girls through gender responsive pedagogy at a very young age. 
uh, in which uh, basically we would tackle the issue with children who have not yet set their minds about who they are and, and what they should be, where society basically will determine uh, what is expected of them. Um, the toolkit is a collaborative effort between FAWE and VVOB with support and input from the UNESCO Institute, uh, in International Institute for Capacity Building in Africa, as well as the United Nations Girls' Education Initiative, UNGAI, as well as representatives of the Ministers of Education of Zambia, South Africa, and Rwanda, and VVOB teams of South Africa, Zambia, and Rwanda. The process began in 2017 and was concluded in February 2019, so this toolkit is brand new, and it has been tested by a group of teachers uh, in a selected number of schools in the three countries mentioned, and finally we have printed it. Included in the toolkit is an explanation of gender responsive pedagogy and its relevance in ECE, with content around lesson planning, lesson delivery, teaching and learning environment, as Martha said, which are very important to create a gender responsive environment. The toolkit also uh, encourages teachers and school leaders to engage parents and the broader community to avoid conflict between what the children are exposed to at school and the reality of the communities that they live in. The toolkit comprises of five booklets. I would love to show them to you if it's possible. Um, I ask the team to show. Here it is. Are they, are they able to view it? I'm not sure if the yes, participants yes, yes. are able to wait, view wait. it. Yes, we can see you. Okay, fantastic. This is what it looks like. This is the fancier version. So as you can see, it's very colorful because we have some very creative people in our teams. And we thought for early education, it would be nice to present something that's also colorful, both for the teachers and the learners. And it comprises five booklets. So I will show them one by one. So this is basically the booklet, which has an introduction to gender in education and basically focuses also on the importance of gender already in, uh, in Africa, in the African con context. The booklet two is actually on gender responsive pedagogy and early childhood education teachers. And this gives basically some uh, tips and tricks uh, to teachers on how to talk about gender uh, in the classroom and uh, you know, also gives them some practical guide on how to uh, tackle gender issues in, in, in the classroom. For example, by highlighting that um, all boys and girls can do the same professions and by talking about other things that maybe they perceive as, as, uh, as gendered. Then um, it also goes further at uh, giving guidance on how to make a gender responsive lesson. Booklet three, here it is. This looks at gender responsive pedagogy and school leaders and is targeting particularly uh, school leaders because they have a very important role in creating a gender responsive environment in the schools and encouraging teachers to do the same. Then we have uh, the, the booklet, booklet four, which is the most interesting for teachers actually, together with booklet two, as it looks at how to engage the young learners on issues of gender. So it has examples of designs which promote gender equality. So whether it's a boy, for example, who's washing the dishes, or there is a boy who is carrying a child, or there are other, you know, the, the, the girls are also playing with cars and things like that. So this is a very, very practical uh, guide, um, sorry, a practical uh, document that the teachers can photocopy and that they can use to actually engage the learners on issues of gender. The same goes for book uh, 4A, which also has some stories. And um, it's another way, it's another uh, tool that the teachers can use to engage the children uh, on gender. And then uh, we end with a game. So because VVOB believes in the power of play for learning and uh, also for adults, we ended the booklet with um, the Go Gender Game. And basically this is a very simple snakes and ladders game which uh, basically allows for uh, participants, a maximum of, I think, uh, six uh, groups or six people to play at one time uh, with uh, a simple dice and some counters, and which basically allows for the participants to learn about gender concepts referring to the booklets, to the, the, the booklets that I've mentioned, to the toolkit, 
Um, but also, it's, 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 uh, it's possible to play without necessarily having read the toolkit, and which allows the participants to uh, gouge their own sense of their understanding of gender responsive pedagogy. And it's uh, aimed, it's targeting teachers and, uh, and school leaders. So this is what it looks like uh, in practice. Um, also, there are some question cards that are related to the gender go game, which are available also as part of the toolkit. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Yes, this is what it looks like in reality. I've already shown it to you, so that's fantastic. Okay. So uh, what next? Uh, what next? Uh, we, have, um, we have planned together with FAWE as well as other partners to actually uh, look at how we can uh, roll out this, uh, this toolkit. So we are conceptualizing and planning a number of initiatives, um, capacity development initiatives, to roll out the toolkit in sub-Saharan Africa. So we plan to intervene in multiple countries, um, contextualizing the toolkit as a first uh, point, because uh, it is very important that the context is reflected in each uh, toolkit. So what is applicable, for example, for Zambia might not be applicable for a country like, like Senegal, for example. Uh, we want to build the capacity of student teachers uh, through teacher education institutions as a next step. And we also want to build the capacity of teachers who are already teaching in schools through teacher uh, development structures of the Ministry of Education and also of school communities. So also trying to engage the parents on how they can be involved in changing the gender dynamics of the school uh, through the Parents Teachers Association. And we also want to uh, build the capacity of school leaders in the schools so that we have a, a larger number of people embracing, um, embracing the concept of having to intervene uh, already at a, at a young age uh, and creating this gender responsive uh, environment. Um, the interventions would be accompanied by capacity building of education managers because we believe that even policy managers as well as um, education uh, authorities have a role to play in gender budgeting, gender analysis and gender mainstreaming because they have a role to play also in providing the means for gender responsive um, pedagogy to be uh, rolled out. Um, one such initiative that is already taking place is a small scale pilot which is happening in Zambia right now. And the timeline for this uh, initiative is from August to December 2019. So we have just started. And so we're excited to see what is going to happen. Um, but this, this uh, pilot is also being accompanied by a research, uh, which is going to be presented more in detail by uh, Dr. Hatembo Moya from the University of Zambia. So I would like to hand over to him and he can give us a more background and uh, a bit of the preliminary findings from the baseline, as well as other information that we have already uh, received from implementing this, uh, this program here uh, in Zambia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh... Yes, and uh, thank you, everyone. Just to pick up from where she has uh, left it off. So basically, we have uh, already undertaken uh, part, we started the pilot uh, project, and we have conducted a baseline already whose objective is to measure the impact of GRP for ECE, uh, related uh, capacity building interventions on knowledge, attitudes, and practices of ECE teachers and school leader. And of course, with a particular focus on teacher awareness of stereotypes, uh, teachers' abilities to challenge stereotypes through questioning, and the use of gender responsive uh, group work. And basically, this, is a, uh, this study has got a very a small, what I would call a, a small sample size, and of course, uh, it is a pilot, so for now, we'll try to use this to actually try and understand what's obtaining uh, on the ground. We have 10 schools. Um, five of these schools are intervention schools, and five, the other five, are control schools. So basically, the intervention is meant to introduce uh, GRP to teachers in the intervention schools and then try to measure the impact uh, of you know the GRP uh, on the schools in the uh, on the teachers in the intervention schools as compared to the teachers in the control schools so we have five intervention schools and five uh, control schools uh, we are looking uh, we're focusing basically on 10 teachers in these schools 
and in each school, two school leaders, so that makes it 20 school leaders, and 30 members of the Parent Teachers Association or Parent Teachers uh, Committee. Uh, this, the baseline version of the study, and I'm going to talk about the uh, design uh, in just a little bit, was basically, um, was basically conducted in central Zambia in a place called Chibombo District. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, thank you very much. So, the previous slide. Back. Thank you. That's the slide. So, the study itself is in four phases. And we are currently at phase one, which is the baseline, where we are looking at intervention and control schools. And this is the focus of the presentation that I'm making here. Uh, this afternoon, it's afternoon in Lusaka. There is going to be then an intervention uh, that is going to be uh, implemented by VDOB. And then the, uh, the research partner, which is the University of Zambia, is going to go back for a midline and eventually conduct an end evaluation, as you can see from the slides. I'd like to share at uh, this juncture so basically, some of the preliminary findings that have emerged from the baseline study that we have conducted. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you very much. So we tried to look, uh, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, so we spoke about the, the participants being teachers, school leaders and members of the PTA. For the baseline study, we involved teachers and school leaders, and I'm going to present the findings on that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll speak through that. I noticed that some of the, uh, the, the slides are hidden behind there, so I'll talk through what I have here. So with regards to the teachers, uh, teachers reported that they were actually aware of gender roles and their own personal views about these gender roles. And they also alluded to the fact that they actually discussed these with others, including fellow teachers, other learners, but also other members of the community, and even at places like church when they go to church. Also, when we tried to look at the practice of GRP with the teachers, we found that uh, when we asked teachers whether they created gender-responsive learning opportunities, teachers reported that they actually did this, and this was mostly done by assigning tasks and mixing the groupings of children. So by mixing groups, teachers believed that this uh, provided opportunities for gender-responsive uh, learning. Teachers were also asked uh, if they engaged in conversations about gender roles. And they reported that they actually did this. And this was done mainly by explaining uh, the concept of gender roles, mostly during tasks that were assigned to the learners. So, for instance, uh, when activities were assigned, teachers used this as an opportunity to explain uh, gender roles. Of course, we did observe some variations, and I'm going to come to that as I conclude basically what the findings are, because in some of the places, some of the teachers reported that they did not engage in this, and they gave uh, some reasons. We also found out that teachers also gave examples when they were asked whether they used examples to challenge, I mean, about uh, traditional gender roles during discussions, and teachers reported that they actually gave uh, examples of traditional gender roles, and this was done mostly during discussions about uh, traditional ceremonies or other related topics that were done or undertaken during class. For instance, one of the teachers uh, reported that she told uh, boys to work hard because when they grow up, they would be the ones to provide uh, for the families. Now, of course, this has got implications on what we are discussing here, and that will come up in the concluding uh, statement. 
Teachers also grouped learners, and this was done using a variety of means. Uh, for instance, some of the learners were grouped according to performance in classroom. Some of the learners were grouped uh, according to maybe the levels at which they were in terms of uh, acquisition of materials. So slow learners were sort of lumped in one group. Then the first learners in another group, and this was done according to the teachers to facilitate giving attention to those learners that needed attention uh, the most. Uh, we did observe that for a number of uh, schools, there were most of the groups were actually mixed gender in nature. Um, and there were instances, of course, where uh, learners were grouped according to gender. One such uh, instance of grouping children like that was, for instance, when children needed to go out to the bathroom or to the toilet. So groups of boys and girls would then be created so that these would be allowed to go and uh, to go to the toilet like that. Uh, teachers also reported that they encouraged interactions between boys and girls, and that this helped the children to know how to relate with each other. This was done mostly during play, and when teachers, when uh, children were given roles, same roles, that is both the boys and the girls were given the same roles. Um, with regards to the school leaders, I'm not sure if that's going to pop up when you go to the next slide, but I'll just move on and present. Um, okay, let's see if it will come up. Move forward, please. No, so just stay there. With regards, uh, you can go back, yes, thank you. With regards to the, uh, the school leaders, they also reported that they were aware of the of gender roles and their own uh, opinions and views about this, and they also reported that they discussed this with a varied number of, uh, of people. So it included fellow teachers. It also included uh, learners during meetings, some also reported that uh, they also uh, discussed with other members of the community. With regards to practice, they, most of the leaders indicated that not much action had been taken to engage the community in actions that directly had a bearing on uh, gender, gender stereotypes. Um, and when this is done, it is mostly done with learners within the school setting. So there <clears throat> there isn't much that has been done to reach out to the community to make sure that community members are also on the same page with the, with the learners. Uh, they also reported that they gave examples that challenged gender stereotypes, at least uh, to the learners, and they used mostly local role models that the learners were familiar with. So including examples of maybe leaders in those specific communities who maybe were female and doing what would considered normally to be a man's job or something like that included the leaders also some of the people who were doing some work in the community that would was considered predominantly female or male uh, you know as 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 when that applies they also gave examples of teachers who were working within those schools that did mostly the work that might be considered to be work, perhaps, of females. So maybe, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, teachers who are senior teachers or where maybe who are school leaders, positions that would consider that were considered mostly to be for males. When you look at these findings overall, some of the things that uh, come up is that most of the teachers and the school leaders reported that they, uh, they were aware of uh, gender roles and these uh, gender stereotypes. However, we also did conduct, uh, and I, I should have mentioned that at the methodology stage, observations of what was happening in the classrooms. So when you look at what we found in the observations, you found that there were actually some variations compared to what the teachers themselves were reporting. So even though the teachers indicated, for instance, that they did try to challenge gender stereotypes. During the observations, what came out quite prominently is that most of the teachers actually failed, even when they observed behaviors in the children that were 
uh, enforcing or, or cementing gender stereotypes, most of the teachers actually failed to challenge these uh, gender stereotypes among uh, so among the among the learners, and we also observed because we spoke to school leaders that the school leaders were not doing much to actually challenge uh, gender stereotypes that were obtaining within the school uh, within the school setting, and this I think proved to be quite a challenge. I think Anna did mention something in terms of I would assume maybe take away notes. Some of the things that are striking or that were striking that we found out is, first of all, this variation in what we observed and the variation in terms of what the teachers reported. And also, I think that uh, off the back of my mind, when I think about it, when we talk about GRP, uh, it's GRP exists in a context. And it seemed that even though many of the people did indicate that they were aware of, you know, uh, gender stereotypes. It seems that a lot needs to be done beyond just GRP itself, but also in the communities and the context in which these teachers are existing. Otherwise, what we observed and we're really curious to see what's going to happen when the intervention has been done uh, is going to be, is, can potentially be contaminated by the context of the communities from where these teachers uh, actually are coming from. Uh, thank you very much. I think the next slide should be back to you, Anna. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe next slide, please. Is there another? Yes, there is. Yes. Um, before we go into the video, uh, I'd like to say that um, basically we will now, uh, during this based on what we have found also from the baseline, we'll try to focus more on mentoring teachers and you know, doing observations because we have found indeed that the teachers know what to say and they know that there's a problem, but they just don't know how to do it. So we'll try to look at coaching and uh, you know, mentoring them and also going back after a while so that the trajectory becomes also a, a, you know, a, a, over time a process where they are also helped to, to, to carry out these interventions. Um, great, so I think we will now show you uh, a video that will basically sum up uh, what we have been discussing about, and here it goes. When we're young, everything seems possible. Boys and girls can dream of becoming a doctor or a marine biologist when they grow up. The difference between these children is purely biological. Gender just doesn't matter yet. Education has the power to either stimulate children's talents and interests so they can achieve their full potential or to reinforce limiting stereotypes. That's why VVOB, Forum for African Women Educationalists, and Public Education Partners joined forces to develop a practical approach to gender-responsive pedagogy for early childhood education. A toolkit that empowers teachers and school leaders to challenge gender stereotypes in the classroom. Small things like sharing examples that challenge gender stereotypes, encouraging all genders to take part in all activities, or bringing dolls into the construction corner can have a meaningful impact on an impressionable young mind. Join us. Challenge the gender divide. Download the GRP for ECE toolkit. Thank you very much. Maybe before handing over back to, um, to you, I'd like to say that we really are looking forward to sharing with you uh, our experiences from implementing this, uh, this toolkit. And uh, we we'll, we'll look forward and we welcome uh, questions from whoever is interested in, in uh, discovering more and in learning about our approaches to capacity development. So please uh, contact us. Um, in the previous slide, there are also the details of our websites. Maybe you can go to the previous slide, please. There we go. Excellent. Um, so yes, please do uh, approach us. We really welcome questions and uh, 
we look forward to more and more people, individuals, organizations actually uh, giving us feedback on their experiences with the toolkit. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, it was amazing to, to hear this uh, presentation um, and more information about this toolkit. Uh, so thank you so much, Martha and Anna and Dr. Hatembo. Um, it's exciting already that we have um, very interested uh, and eager <laughs> participants in this webinar who have already uh, been shooting us with some questions. So um, at this point, I'm going to open it up to the question and answer. Uh, part of the webinar. Um, just a quick reminder again that if you are participating online in either the English channel or the French channel, that you have the opportunity to ask questions directly to the panelists um, through two ways. One is to uh, use the live chat feature, um, and then, then the second is to send an email to webinars at globalpartnership.org. And I think we've received questions in, in both ways so far, so I know that it's working. Um, so to get started, I think I'm going to abuse my powers as moderator and ask two questions I had um, from myself. Um, and then I think already I have a, a list of nine or ten questions um, that we can get started on. And we have um, over half an hour to still address these questions. So, um, you know, please, as you have questions that come up and you're hearing different responses and that's triggering other questions, um, please please be in touch and I think we should have time to address it. Uh, so abusing my powers, my first two questions um, to the team are, um, as an early childhood uh, education specialist, um, I know that there are many different models of service provision for early childhood education. Right, we might have a kind of traditional formal preschool model where it's attached to the primary school um, and run by the government, or we could have it run by um, faith-based organizations or it could be a private center. Um, we also know that um, there are many other options such as community-based programs or home-based programs. Um, there might be kind of accelerated um, school readiness programs that may only take uh, you know, a few months or a smaller period of time to get students ready for primary school. And that countries utilize these different models in different ways to reach as many children as possible for early childhood education. So I guess my first question to you um, is what type of models were you working with in Zambia and how um, do you think uh, this toolkit is applicable to all models or does it lean itself to one or another or how would you see it um, being applied to, to different models? And then my second is more a, lo a logistic question. Um, I know we have here on the website uh, how um, different organizations or countries can access the toolkit, um, but you mentioned early in the presentation about um, making the toolkit fit your context. So I guess more from a practical question, mm -hmm. if my country was interested in implementing this toolkit, what would that process look like? Obviously we would be in touch with you, but um, what is some general feedback of what is the timeline um, to kind of contextualize it um, and roll it out, et cetera, might be some interesting information. So I'm turning it back over to you. Thanks. Uh, since it's about the Zambia model and the only one that exists for now, uh, I'll take it up and uh, support it by Dr. Hatembo. Um, so indeed, there are different types of uh, schools um, at uh, early childhood education. There are the private schools, uh, which are by uh, by far the, the vast majority in Zambia. But for this uh, exercise, so for this uh, um, this pilot that we're implementing, we are targeting a peri uh, urban area, actually peri urban and rural. And so there we find mainly community schools or government schools that have recently began rolling out early childhood education. So we are dealing here mainly with uh, community schools, which are basically um, modeling the kind of government schools, but do not receive any funding from the government. And they're entirely funded by the community, as well as government schools, so public uh, ECE centers, um, which are starting up. They're probably the third, fourth year of ECE provision. Um, but definitely, if we look at the context where we have, for example, uh, faith-based uh, organizations, um, yes, we would look at different kinds of context. We feel that the toolkit as it is, uh, is, is 
is implementable in all of these contexts because there is nothing there that would um, uh, sort of like clash uh, with any of the settings. But definitely we would need as a starting point to look at the level of the teacher. Uh, we have found uh, that um, the teacher needs to have a, a certain level of training um, and would benefit um, from, uh, would receive rather um, better absorption of the toolkit if they have a higher level of training. So that's why we are looking at, you know, what kind of intervention uh, methods would best, best suit teachers who have not had uh, good training. And that's why we're trying to look at more coaching, more mentoring, as well as more observation so that uh, in addition to the theory, they're also given enough time to practice some of the elements that are here. Um, so yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Second question. Can I go into that one already? Do you have another follow-up question? No, sorry. Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, in terms of logistics, you said, uh, yes, the toolkit is available online, and we already have experience in contextualizing it, actually. Uh, we have um, contextualized it for Vietnam. So uh, we didn't mention it before, but uh, we have already uh, done a contextualization in a country that is not uh, in Africa. And uh, basically, we have done a translation of the toolkit and looked at tweaking certain elements of it. So, for example, the way gender is, is looked at in the African or sub-Saharan African context is different from the gender dimensions of education in Asia. So we looked at those in, 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 in particular and tried to tweak the text uh, to that. Um, but you'll find that, by and large, a lot of the issues regarding uh, giving equal opportunities to boy and, boys and girls are applicable in, in many uh, parts of the developing world. So you'll find that the dynamics are, are quite similar. But of course, in certain countries, you might find that religion plays a bigger role. So for example, if we're looking at a country that has um, a more, um, how can I say it? It's, it's more uh, influenced by religious beliefs, then we would have to look at those elements and try to incorporate them. So that's why the process of contextualization is very, very key, and it shouldn't involve too much time. So uh, if we look at what has happened in Vietnam, it, it could take as little as three months to actually contextualize the toolkit to a different environment that is completely maybe different in terms of language and in terms of uh, certain um, elements of gender and the education system as well. Thanks, Anna. And your point on religion um, spurs one of our, our questions from our participants, um, which in some ways you answered this, but I, I want to ask it directly. Um, the question is asking, can relig religion enhance gender discrimination and how to address that without hurting people's beliefs and habits? Um, this person uh, thinks that religious leaders um, uh, could represent a kind of resistance to some of this work. So just kind of, we wanted to understand your, your reactions to that um, and how much was religion um, a factor in the places where you've conducted pilots? Well, uh, in the place where we're conducting the pilots, it's more culture. Um, and of course, culture and religion are very interrelated. Um, so, yes, we are dealing with very conservative environments. So we're dealing with uh, communities that are a bit, you know, they, they have cultures and they have norms that they want to hold on to. But we're trying to emphasize the point of giving each child an opportunity to thrive, um, irrespective of their religion. Religion can be uh, uh, still worked around. You can still give a girl an opportunity to become a doctor even though uh, you know, she is from an environment where women are traditionally um, in roles that are not uh, necessarily linking to uh, the world of work. But it's definitely a million dollar question and uh, we will find out as we go along how to work more on these elements. But definitely what is the issue we're trying to address is also um, how can we change uh, how people perceive the role of women 
And if we can do that from an early age, if we can do that through teachers, if we can change how uh, the dynamics at the school level and make parents understand that their children are highly intelligent and that they can aspire to become more because the communities actually are a very big resistance factors, then we can, we can work. But it's definitely a long, long process and does require the engagement of families, including religious leaders. And maybe that's one thing that we did not mention during uh, the presentation, and Dr. Hatembo can yeah. talk to that as well, is the role of the religious leaders in implementing uh, this program is very cardinal. So we need to try to reach out to them as part of a larger community. Dr. Hatembo, do you want to add on to that? Yes, thank you very much. So indeed, religion, I think... Uh, it did emerge, it was in a, a small way, and it's something that we captured and have definitely planned for the next phase of the, uh, of the study to try and explore in much depth. But as Anna has said, religion and culture are actually interrelated. In fact, uh, religion manifests itself in culture. Is it culture manifests itself in religion? Both interplay with each other, and therefore we are... Uh, you know, anticipating to see something about the role that religion itself can play in uh, either as a way of mediating, you know, gender stereotypes or indeed even, uh, you know, like uh, enforcing them. And if you recall, I'd made uh, a statement in my presentation as I concluded about how gender exists in a context and this context includes religion and culture and how intervention actually uh, needs the support of both, but how it can also influence, you know, uh, sort of like as a reverse, how gender uh, responsiveness can actually inform religion and culture overall. Great. Thank you. Chris, Christina, can I add something to that? Sure, Martha, and then I have two questions directly directed to you <laughs> once, once you're finished. Yeah, no, I just thanks Anna and Dr. Kerr. I wanted to add on to the issue of religion and just to say that we, we shall, we plan to borrow on lessons that we learned from the GRP for secondary and primary schools. Religion came out as one of the issues that uh, uh, posed a challenge, but then it was tackled. And there were many strategies that were laid in, in line to that. And one of it was involving the religious leaders themselves. One of it is making them appreciate um, the diversity and also appreciating that it's important to have the girls go to school and for them to be given equal opportunities with the, with the boys. Because one of the issues was in the areas where some of the girls were being married off at an early age uh, in the name of religion. But we had quite a number of religious leaders themselves that really were in for the girls going to school. And these were the, the change agents that were being used to talk to the others. And somehow, in I would say about 80%, it worked out well. So we plan also to borrow from some of those lessons as we handle the early childhood education. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martha, for coming in. That was a very important context. So two questions that have come in from um, participants directed to you. Um, the first is that they would like to hear an example of gender-based underrepresentation in STEM um, and how uh, your organization is addressing this issue as part of your activities. Um, and another one uh, relates to slide five, in which um, slide five pointed out that teachers harass children at school. Um, you know, this participant was curious, what are the forms of that harassment um, and how does this happen? Which was, was the first one, Christine? Just again, the first one. Uh, if you can provide an example of gender-based under-representation under in STEM. Uh-huh. And how your organization yeah. might be addressing this. Okay. Yeah, the gender under-representation in STEM, I, I want to believe this is... Uh, known to many of us, where going in Africa, the tradition has been that, uh, I mean the picture, the impression that has been created was sciences was meant for the boys and not the girls. So that has been a perception by the teachers, by the community, by the parents, and even by the girls themselves, because they have grown up knowing uh, STEM is not for the girls, it's for the boys. 
And as they start their education, they have that at the back of the mind. And many of them would, option, would opt out into, I mean, they would opt into humanities. And we, when we realized that, because the, with the research that was done in early 2005, it re re revealed that there were very few girls in STEM. And one of the factors that was contributing to the low number was the perception and the feeling, the traditional feeling that STEM was for the girls. And what we did is we came up with a program under STEM, which promotes girls for STEM. It is called STEM for Girls. And into this, we have built capacities of teachers to teach from a gender responsive perspective. The teaching methodology, first of all, was in itself very, very complicated, where it made science appear very difficult. And therefore, when it appears difficult, it's like this for the boys, not for the girls. But with the interactions we've had with the teachers in terms of using like the day-to-day -day examples, living, using the life examples, not teaching from the abstract, but teaching from the life experiences. It has motivated mo many more girls and many girls have ended up taking on uh, sciences. And also the clubs that we have established in school where the girls themselves realize that they can actually do sciences and do it very well at that. It has also uh, motivated the girls. We have used role models, the women that have succeeded in sciences, going back to the schools and talking to the girls, mentoring them and assuring them that this is something that they can be able to do just because they also did it. So because of that, it has opened up the minds, has opened the eyes of the girls and uh, there are many more girls now into science. Of course, it is not 100%. We are not yet there but we have made very positive strides in that. So that is uh, uh, the response to that. Then the next one in terms of uh, sexual harassment, the form of, I mean, sorry, harassment to, to girls in schools. There are different forms of harassment, but when you talk about uh, uh, teachers, it has been revealed, and uh, this has been in newspapers, it has been on television where teachers in different countries have had sexual harassment to the girls, which could be uh, through assault, through, you know, enticing them, and many of the girls have fallen prey because of that. And some of the, the, the measures we've put in place is trying to uh, use the model that Fawe has, which is called Tuseme, that's a Swahili word, it means speaking out, because most of the girls have been shy, but we have been building their capacities, trying to uh, enhance their self-esteem so that they are able to speak out and talk about many of this. And many girls have come out to say they are being harassed, physically harassed, sexually harassed, and also verbally harassed through the words. And that's why we're talking about the language that is used in the classroom, what language the teachers use. Many girls have been harassed verbally. Many have been harassed through bad touches. They are all those forms of... Uh, uh, sexual har I mean harassment to the girls, but the worst has been issues of sexual harassment, where even the girls, many of them have then gotten pregnant and dropped out of school as a result of that. So these are some of the things that have been uh, happening into school, and that's uh, the reason why we come up with all these uh, uh, models and all the efforts to see that they, they, they are eliminated and that they give the girls an opportunity to pursue their education to completion. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, as always, or as we had been for the past 20 minutes, we have a very interactive uh, list of participants. So the questions are keep on, on coming and I'll try to get to them. Um, a few more uh, for the full group. Um, a few, uh, I guess this first one is a little bit more on the practical side. Um, and I know we, we touched on some of this already, but specifically, how does the teacher interact with and benefit from the toolkit. So maybe um, the team can just walk us a little bit more through of what it looks like from the teacher's perspective, um, what type of training, how often is this mentoring or coaching, um, you know, are they physically getting this manual, just what it looks like from the teacher's perspective I think would be helpful for the participants. Um, a second question is about the linkages across uh, the levels of education. And I know as uh, someone working in early childhood, this is on often a struggle is you can have um, a curriculum uh, for early childhood that is very 
disconnected with what a child um, then is supposed to learn in first grade and the curricula don't necessarily talk to each other. Um, so just thinking through of this um, pedagogy for early childhood, how does it relate to maybe other tools um, and kind of continuing on into primary school and secondary school? Uh, a third question is we had, um, what is the role or what has been the role of civil society in implementing this toolkit? And then my fourth question, um, and then I'll open it back to you. The fourth question um, is for Dr. Hatembo specifically, um, what were some of the mo more surprising results um, from the baseline in your work? And when do you expect the midline or endline um, uh, surveys to take place? Sorry, so maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Lusaka. Great. Okay, thank you. So I will start with the first one that you just posed uh, about the practical aspects. Uh, what does the training look like and uh, duration and um, things like that? So um, we are trying this out. We haven't got a method that we feel is you know, solid at the moment. Um, and that's why we're using this as a pilot, as a learning uh, experience. What we have seen is that um, it does require uh, at least two days uh, to train, to introduce the concept of gender responsive pedag pedagogy, and maybe Martha can allude to more of their experience over that. And one important thing that we have found is that it's very important to keep teachers separate from school leaders, for example because uh, teachers do not feel very free to, sp to speak about stereotypes, about their own beliefs, uh, um, together with the school leaders. So it's very important that those two groups are kept separate uh, at some point, and that the teachers are then able, once they have been given this knowledge, to actually have the time to practice. So that's why this toolkit is not only theoretical in nature, it is also practical. Uh, like I mentioned when I was showing you the booklet, uh, booklet four and <coughs> booklet two in particular um, basically provide t uh, tips and tricks for the teacher to actually try and put in implement uh, what is given in the uh, as guidance uh, in in the whole toolkit basically. And in on one of the booklets, booklet four, booklet four, four A, there's actually some things that they can borrow and that they can use and that, that they can tailor to their needs in the classroom to actually do activities to uh, make the theory become practical. So we have tried to make this a practical toolkit so that uh, in addition to knowing the theory of what they're supposed to be doing or not doing, they actually have examples that will make their experience with gender responsiveness uh, more, um, you know, more feasible and more uh, practical. Um, so yeah, this is basically our our initial experiences. I was not part of the training team, so I can't give you more details about, uh, you know, duration and what we would recommend because we're still trying it out, um, and we will be glad, uh, we'll be happy to uh, actually share more once we have this information. But definitely one thing that we have found out and that we are trying to uh, follow up on is the fact that the teachers need more coaching, more mentoring, more observation. And so they need to have more time to actually practice what they're learning. <coughs> Other comes theory again and not practice. Um, yes, uh, thank you. And then I think Martha might be better placed to look at linkages across the levels of education, which was the, the, the second question, uh, unless you want to add maybe a bit more to the first question, no, it's which is the practical I'll take thing. Care of the... yeah. One about the dates and okay. uh, yeah. yeah. So maybe over to Martha for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I can I go on? Yes, Martha, go ahead. Okay. So maybe before I go to the linkages at different levels, I just wanted to to add something in terms of the GRP, the number of days, and this is just from the experience of what we have had in the past in relation to the GRP for primary and secondary. The two are not very different, but only they address different levels. But uh, 
for the teachers that are already in service, um, the practice, the, the days required are between three and five days. And uh, what has happened is uh, we took the approach of the TOT, and this would be the same approach that we would uh, uh, take on for the early childhood education, training of trainers, having TOTs, and then they are able to cascade the, the um, the training within their respective uh, schools. Uh, but we are also thinking of uh, working with the ministries and uh, the curriculum development centers in terms of how to make part of this toolkit as part of the teacher training program so that by the time the teachers are coming out of the training uh, institutions, they are well equipped with the, the different skills in terms of how to approach the children, how to encourage them, how to teach from a gender responsive uh, approach. Uh, looking at the linkages at different levels of uh, education, I think this explains why we found it very necessary to have uh, uh, GRP for early childhood development because uh, education starts at an early age and it grows to the different levels. So if the children are at an early age taught from a, a gender responsive pedagogy approach, from a gender responsive approach, the chances that those children will grow up into gender responsive persons at the different levels of education are very, very high. And that is one of the reasons why I was saying, instead of uh, waiting to I mean, to train the teachers or to attend to the children at a, not, at a later stage when they're adults, it's good to start from this early stage. It, it will be a ripple effect to the next levels of education. By the time they get into primary school, they already have that foundation. They respect each other. The boys respect the girls. The girls look at the boys at their peers. And as they grow to the different levels, the whole cycle gets broken down. And that is what I would take on as the linkages between the different levels of education. Maybe, uh, if I can, sorry, um, just add on a, a bit to also what Martha has said. Um, targeting school leaders, we are also hoping that uh, the intervention will not have only benefits for um, the early childhood section of the schools, uh, and in our context, these schools are always, you know, within a primary school, so that the intervention can also benefit uh, older children. So we're hoping that uh, the intervention will spread um, to the uh, other grades, and also, uh, in, you know, involving the school community will also have uh, a ripple effect to the other areas. And also, these teachers move on. So, you know, we are hoping that... Uh, as we train more, both at in-service and, as Martha said, at pre-service, that we will have a, a bigger group of teachers who are aware of the pedagogy, who are aware of, of these key uh, um, practical ways of having a good, uh, a positive learning environment for kids, and, and that will basically have an effect also at primary, but also at uh, you know, early secondary at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that there were also two questions for me on the most interesting findings from the from the baseline, and also the uh, when we expect or when we hope to go back for the midline and the endline. So let me speak to that first. So we are hoping that uh, by mid of October, which is just in about two to three weeks, we should go back for the midline, and then towards the end of November to go back now for the end line. So that's the projected timeline that we have. So basically to undertake those activities at that time and then prepare the documents. Then what were the most finding, uh, interesting findings, or at least surprising findings from uh, our survey? I think for me what strikes me the most is the contradiction between what teachers say they did and what teachers were observed to be doing. As I mentioned when I was making the presentation earlier, 
many of the teachers did indicate that they were aware of uh, these gender uh, stereotypes or basically how to apply GRP. But when we tried to observe this during the observations in the classroom sessions, we actually saw that they had a difficulty. Actually, they had a tough time trying to, you know, uh, trying to apply GRP. Many of the teachers actually enforced gender stereotypes. Like I, I mentioned that uh, one of the teachers mentioned to the learners and said that you should work very hard, harder than the girls, because when you grow up, you're going to be the breadwinner. And we also saw some examples of uh, teachers, for instance, uh, questioning boys, why are you crying? Boys are not supposed to cry. So all of those actually uh, enforce gender stereotypes, but the teachers may not have necessarily recognized that they were doing that because most of that was happening unconsciously. This has a lot of implications, and one of the things that I think about, going back to the question of religion and culture, is the deep-seatedness, the deep-seatedness of culture within which these teachers actually operate or the context in which they exist and how difficult it is for them to try and embrace what they believe is the right thing and try to apply it in a context that doesn't really see it to be the right thing. And I think that's one of the, uh, one of the things that this program, if well implemented, I think could really try and uh, take care of. Um, we also saw some teachers who had uh, a very difficult time uh, to actually try to challenge gender stereotypes. So it was just very, very difficult for them, even when they observed that the uh, behaviors that were being exhibited by these children was actually enforcing gender stereotypes, and they knew it. It was very difficult to actually challenge that. I think I found that uh, quite uh, interesting. In many of the schools, almost all the schools that we went, also there was, um, you know, there was lack of playing materials, and I, I really felt that that could have been an opportunity for teachers to actually use in order to try and uh, inculcate GRP in the children. And I think that 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 finding also has got a lot of implications in terms of how uh, teachers can be trained in GRP. I would give or take those three really uh, came out, but especially the first one, which I think is an overarching uh, finding, which has got serious implications for pretty much everything going forward. And we're really looking forward to see what's going to happen once the intervention has been implemented. If there will be some kind of change or variation with regards the teacher's practices of GRP themselves. Thank you. Great, thank you. We only have a few more minutes, so I have one remaining question. There are many more, um, so I'll, I'll just let participants know that if you have um, questions, please feel free to still submit them uh, via email to webinars at globalpartnership.org, and we'll make sure they are channeled back uh, to our presenters. Um, so I apologize in advance, I didn't get to all of them, but I do want to get to one last one, um, and then I have some concluding remarks. So this last one is diving a little bit deeper. Um, it's departing a little bit from uh, just gender stereotyping to ask about what is the role of gender diversity in the toolkit? Um, is there a strategy um, to issues of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity in this toolkit? Um, I can start. <laughs> this is a very interesting topic and uh, a very interesting um, question. We had a lot of discussions about this when we were developing the, the toolkit, um, but we have to remember that we operate in a context where these discussions are basically not possible. So uh, because we developed this toolkit uh, together with the Ministry of Education in the three countries I mentioned, we had to actually align to what is policy. And in these three countries, there is not much room to talk about gender diversity beyond female and male. Uh, so, or rather, between, uh, yeah, gender diversity between the, yeah, the, the two sexes uh, that are recognized in these countries. But we did have uh, a lot of discussions with the teams from South Africa 
which actually have this in their context. And so part of the contextualization process that we will have in our program in South Africa will be to incorporate these other elements. Um, but indeed, this is basically very uh, contextual. So important to keep in mind, if you want to use it with public government teachers, uh, if you want to use it safely in the context where you're operating, you need to align to uh, the reality on the ground, and some things are maybe not uh, acceptable. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you've put it quite well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very sensitive issue, and I think that, uh, as Anna has, has said, whatever happens, I, I think that really needs to be done with the awareness that if there is any perception for, of a departure from what is acceptable within the context, that creates a, a problem and, of course, mm -hmm. might not receive the, the needed uh, you know, support uh, from government through the ministries, yeah. which is a necessary key, uh, I mean, a necessary driver to make sure that this program is actually delivered uh, to a wide uh, range of you know, uh, context. So if that were to be the case, you might find that the whole process could be stifled. Yeah. I think that's what I can say. Yeah. And maybe just to conclude on that, for us, the issue is about equal opportunities. So each child should be given equal opportunities to play, to, 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 do, um, to learn and to have a safe environment regardless of their sexual orientation. And that's our key message. So, yeah. I could also add just something, I think, from the study uh, perspective that even when we were in the field and as we still go back, I think we'll make it very clear to the participants and the respondents that we're not here to alter anything as it were. We are just interested to find out on your practice, on your attitudes, on your knowledge about uh, gender responsiveness. Great, thank you both. Um, I want to, I'm gonna make a few concluding remarks, but um, I want to turn it back over to Martha to see, um, to check in with Martha if you have any um, kind of concluding statements from your side that you want to share. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Maybe just as I conclude, I asked about the role of civil society in implementing the tool, and I think we didn't uh, touch that, but I want to say that like Anna had mentioned, this is an effort that was uh, put in by VVOB and FAWE, but it's for everybody, all stakeholders in education, to be able to cascade because all civil society play a very great role and they work with the different uh, ministries of education and it is uh, our responsibility as the FAWE and VVOB to see how we bring on board the different uh, civil society organizations in terms of understanding the, the toolkit and how they can be able to cascade the toolkit. But thank you so much. This has been very good. But in case of anything, we are still available and anybody is free to reach out to us and we shall, we shall be able to make clarification where need be. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Martha. And so at this point, uh, we're going to conclude the webinar um, with a brief thank you again to Martha, Anna, and Dr. Hatembo um, for their wonderful insights, um, both on the context um, of you know, why this toolkit is needed, as, as well as explaining um, the toolkit and uh, the research that went behind it. Um, I'm extremely happy that this toolkit exists um, and that we had such an active uh, participation in this webinar, I think, is just one small indication um, of how this is really um, an area where we need more support, we need um, more work done, and I think the level of interest um, from participants in trying to understand how they could disseminate it in their own context is very promising. Uh, so for the participants, I urge you again, um, you can reach out to us over email for any follow-up questions on the presentation, but please feel free to also go online um, to either organization, um, and I'm sure they can happily uh, help you directly. Um, so just as a concluding uh, housekeeping item, I just want to remind everyone that, that the session today uh, was recorded. Um, so in a few days' time, if you registered, we will send out a link uh, to the recording, which you please feel free to share um, within your own organization or your own network um, so we can continue to spread the word about this uh, great toolkit. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you.